Hello everyone and welcome to the short video tutorial series of Planet Pro. I'm Mike Shaw. In this video, let's talk about how to build a 3D model in Planet without using any other 3D modeling software. Now this video is an intermediate level video tutorial. So if you're just starting with Planet, feel free to skip this one and watch other more introductory level videos. Then after you use Planet for a while, you'll find the need to build your own 3D models and you can come back to watch this and learn how to do that. Now in the last video, I showed you how to create a cube shape for the panorama tower using a single command like this. But you're probably wondering, what about other shapes? Well, we put some descriptions here just as a reference, but it's hard to learn just from that. So we've prepared this video to teach you how the whole process works. The commands, or actually the scripting language, are an extension of the OBJ programming language. The OBJ programming language is a 3D model definition language supported by many 3D modeling software packages. It has a text format instead of binary, making it perfect for editing with a text editor. However, the default OBJ language only allows you to define vertices, faces, and lines. So for example, to define even a simple cubic shape, you'd need to define eight vertices and six faces. It's a total nightmare to write all this manually. So that's why we created this OBJ extension language, which allows you to define commonly used 3D geometries and then put them together just like Lego blocks. The benefit is that you can now create 3D models without using any other tools. You can do everything inside Planet. Second, the language is perfect for symmetric buildings such as TV towers, lighthouses, and simple skyscrapers. But it's not so ideal for complicated buildings such as buildings with many curves or irregular shapes. So let's take a look at what 3D geometries are available. The first set are geometries with a rectangular base, such as a cube, a pyramid, or a pyramidal frustum. Here's the name of the geometry. The picture of it is here. Then you can find out how to define each geometry over here. For example, you can specify a cube's length, width, and height. If all three are the same, you can use the first format, which simply defines the length. If the base is a square, which means the length is the same as the width, then you can use the second format. Finally, if all three values are different, use the last format. The pyramid has almost the same three formats as the cube, except the top is a point instead of a rectangle. The pyramidal frustum is like a cube, but the top and the bottom have rectangles of two different sizes. That's why you can define L for the length of the base, then L2 for the length of the top. The next group of geometries are 3D geometries that have a base of a circle or an equilateral polygon. In this group, we define radius instead of length and width because all the shapes are symmetrical. The S parameter will determine the number of sides for the base. By default, it's 10, which means the base will be a decagon that almost looks like a circle. If you want more sides, you can increase the S value all the way to 50. For example, if you use three, the base will be a triangle. If six, it'll be a hexagon. The base can also be an oval instead of a circle by using different Rx and Ry as shown in the last format. The last group of geometries are spherical types of shapes. These are the sphere, the dome, and the torus. To create an oval or an egg shape, you can define different radii for the x, y, and z axes. Then for the torus, there are two radii. The bigger Rx is the radius of the ring, which is the distance from the center of the pipe to the center of the torus. The small rx is the radius of the pipe itself. Now let's pay attention to the origin and to the end that we marked on each geometry. Let's go back to the first one. The default origin will be at the coordinate 0, 0, 0, if you define this geometry so that the origin will be placed at 0, 0, 0. For shapes after this geometry, their origin will be moved to where the end of the first shape is. Then the next geometry's origin will start from there, and so on so you can see that the geometries will stack up on top of each other. The origin of pretty much all the geometries is at their bottom center, and their ends are at their top center. There are only two exceptions, which are the sphere and the torus, which have both their origin and ends at their geometric centers. Then we have vertex, face, and line. You can define a vertex using its x, y, and z coordinates, then you just need to remember the order of the vertices because when you define a face or a line, you need to refer to those vertices using the order, with the first defined vertex having an order of one. So you'd refer to it as one, and so forth. As you can see, it would be challenging to write all this code manually, so only use it when you have to define a face or a line that can't be part of one of those predefined geometries we mentioned earlier. 
You can also move the origin using the move command. It's a relative move. In other words, a relative movement along the x, y, or z axis from their current origin. What if you want to move the origin to some absolute value? Just use the vertex command. You can also move x or y or z relatively by using a value using mx, my, and mz commands respectively. Then we have the rotate command, which will rotate the next geometry by an angle. R is the same as RZ, which will rotate the shape horizontally along the Z axis. RX and RY will rotate the shape along the X and Y axes respectively. And rotations use the left-handed rotation rule, if you know what that means. Otherwise, just try to rotate a shape by some value to see its rotation direction. You can also draw shapes using colors and opacity. You can do this by defining a material with a name using the new MTL command. After the new MTL command, you can define the color using red, green, and blue colors. Their values range from 0 to 255. Or you can use the hex color format. You can find this in many software tools, including Photoshop. The opacity is a simple floating number between 0 and 1, where 0 means completely transparent and 1 means completely opaque. Later, you can use the material by referring to the name using the use MTL command. Usually we define all the materials used at the beginning and use them when we need them later on. Now, let's take a look at a couple of examples, starting with two simple ones. First, let's define a cube of 10 by 20 by 30. By default, all the values are in meters, so this is what that will look like. The second example adds a pyramid on top of the cube. The pyramid's base is 10 by 20, which is the same as the cube. The height of the pyramid is 15. As I said earlier about the origin and the end, that's why the pyramid is automatically put or stacked on top of the cube. Now here's a more complex one. I won't go through all the lines, but you can see the potential of this simple language. And from this model, you can see that we've defined colors and opacity. This shape is transparent. This sphere has a blue color, as defined here. This cylinder has a red color, as defined here. Now you may have a question. How do you know the size or the dimensions of different parts of the tower? It's actually pretty simple. Let's take the famous Portland Head Light as an example. First, try to find a photo of it on the web. Or you can take a photo yourself. Make sure it was shot from a distant location using a telephoto lens. If it's a wide-angle shot, it'll have distortion from the wide-angle lens, making the measurements inaccurate. So here, we've loaded the picture in Photoshop. Crop it so that it will cover the exact height of the lighthouse. Now from Wikipedia, the height of the lighthouse is 24.38 meters. So let's resize the image in Photoshop so that its dimensions are exactly 2,438 pixels. In doing so, this makes each pixel in the photo correspond to a length of one centimeter in real life. Let's switch to the selection tool and drag to create a selection. It says 130 by 160 pixels. What that means is this area is 1.3 meters by 1.6 meters. So you can see that you can use this method to measure any part of the lighthouse. That's pretty straightforward, isn't it? So I'll use the ruler tool to draw in some guidelines to help slice the lighthouse into several simple geometries that Planet supports. Then I can measure each part, find out its sizes, and write those down. For example, if we start at the bottom and select this area, the height is 1,251 pixels, which is 12.51 meters. The radius of the base is 368 pixels, which is 3.68 meters, and so forth. I won't go through all the details, but here is the final script. So now I'll just copy it and paste it into Planet, and we're done. Now let's start to work on a plan. Let's put the camera pin over here. Now I'll view it in the VR viewfinder, and here you go. So let's say I want to check to see if I can take a Milky Way photo with this. So I'll switch to the Milky Way Seeker page and adjust the time and date slider until the Milky Way center rises. And there you go. Let's choose next year and tap to see the list of dates. Select no moon. Now we have the first possible date, February 17th of next year. It's also easy to see if we can photograph a moon rise with this composition. Tap to see the list, uncheck the no moon, check the moon position, same direction as the Milky Way, plus or minus 6 degrees, and the first date is February 16th of next year. Tap it, you can see a moon right here. If the moon is too high, it'll make the Milky Way hard to see. But when the moon just rises, it's not that bright, and it's the perfect time to capture both the moon and the Milky Way. So that's it for this video. Thanks so much for watching, and enjoy learning and using Planet.